All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BX Chess Weekly, episode 101, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And today we got, well, a small-ish episode. There's, for whatever reason, not that much happening right now. There are some interesting things here today. So, you know, let's just get cracking as usual and see what we have today. I have to warn you, I'm a bit under the weather today. I've been really hard uh, opening my eyes in the morning and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So if I'm a bit slow, apologies in advance. Okay, as usual, the first thing we got here is getting started section. We got four articles here today, starting with uh, implementing 2D physics in JavaScript. Really nice walkthrough that teaches you how the, to implement 2D physics on your uh, very simple... Um, I guess game and physics engine like not much of a game engine here but this is a very you know physics heavy article so it's not just purely code it also talks about the whole scientific side of it let's just put it this way so if you are not very good with physics or mathematics then it's going to be a bit confusing at first but uh, nonetheless if you were ever wondering how to do something like this do check this one out it's actually a pretty good write-up all right next article we got here is aborting a fetch request a really good write-up, an introduction to the abort controller that basically allows you to abort fetch starting from, I th what was it introduced, like a couple of years ago? So one of the problem with promises and fetch specifically, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people complain that, okay, we had the XHR request, uh, sorry, X, X, that thing is hard to say, XHR request, right? And uh, you could abort it at any moment you wanted, but then we got fetch, which has a nicer API, but you couldn't abort it at all. So like when you fired off the fetch, there was no way of aborting. You could only discard data, which led to, well, a lot of unnecessary network requests, right? Especially if you have like progressive web app that switches things quickly and user can um, press on things and cancel the old request. With fetch that just wouldn't work, which is why a lot of people and a lot of libraries still rely on XHR, by the way. Uh, the RxJS will be one of the examples, their implementation of the uh, fetching or, or the requests uses XHR because it is abortable. But now that we got a board controller for fetch, you can actually abort fetch requests as well. And this article basically walks you through how exactly you do that. I mean, the you know, the whole idea is pretty trivial. You create a new abort controller, you pass the signal that it returns to the fetch, and then you can call this abort controller abort to, well, abort the fetch request, right? Super, super simple. Uh, is it already implemented? I think it's already implemented, right? It's been added, well, quite a, f like half a year ago or something. So let's see, abort, con there you go. There it is, abort controller, right? Um, here's the question. Let's just go, can I use, and uh, let's just check. When was it implemented? Because I believe it was added like last year or something. Yeah, so it's everywhere, but the Internet Explorer and then the obscure mobile browsers, which nobody cares about. <laughs> so if you are on the modern browser, if you don't have to support IE 11, then it will work. I mean, you know, if you're using Fetch, it's gonna work anyway. So uh, there you go. Yes, you can use it today. It seems like it's been, okay, 2017. So yeah, two years ago, that was, no, three years ago now, okay. It's 2020 already. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're using RxJS. RxJS has a very nice abstraction for uh, requests anyway, so you don't have to care about that too much, I think. But anyway, continuing, we got next article, understanding the Node.js event loop phases and how it executes the JavaScript code. Yet another write-up on how the event loop works. Um, in this case, it talks about Node.js, but you know, it's not specifically Node.js. It's more of an overall event loop in JavaScript. It's nothing uh, node specific in this article as far as I uh, remember. Talks about stuff like, you know, timers, callbacks, preparing, polling, uh, micro tasks, checks, whatever. So if you are just getting started with JavaScript, if you are not 100% sure how the event loop works, uh, this is article for you. If you already know all of that, well, there's nothing really new here. Uh, one thing I would note, there is a comment mentioning a talk from Jake Archibald in the loop which is possibly the best explanation of event loop I've ever seen. So if you haven't seen that one, read the article and then go look at the video. This will probably clean up everything you wanted to ever know about event loop for you. Okay. And the last article we got here for today in getting started section is make a WebGL powered US, country, US counties map with D3 and 3JS. 
It's a really nice introduction to D3 and WebGL um, sort of combination, I guess, and how to use both to render the very fancy map of counties of the US. I mean, you could easily do the same for the world and everything if you're interested. This is how the result looks. And it's just a very nice walkthrough as to, you know, how exactly do you achieve something like this. So if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Obviously, you know, zoomable, draggable and everything. Okay, that is it for the getting started section. We got two articles today. The first one being uh, from Mozilla Hacks, how we build picture in picture in Firefox desktop with more control over video. Really interesting write up on the approaches uh, to picture in picture. So as you know that by now, I think all the uh, major browsers support it. So you got it in Firefox, you got it in Chrome, you got it in Safari, and you got it in uh, new Microsoft Edge. Uh, the interesting thing is that all three browsers, so being Chromium, Firefox, and Edge, uh, or sorry, in Safari, are actually taking different approaches to how they implement picture in picture. And this article um, walks you through showing how exactly, what exactly is the difference, how exactly the implementation work, and why Firefox team chose their specific approach, which is absolutely fascinating to read. So if you're interested in this kind of very low level details and reasoning behind, you know, picking the specific implementation, definitely give it a read. There's some really cool stuff in here as you know, as usual, the Mozilla Hacks blog is probably one of the best sources of like web related uh, de development news. So there you go. Okay, and the next article we got here is building a continuous integration and deployment pipeline using Docker CI and CD, right? So this one walks you through setting up as it says continuous integration and continuous deployment using nothing but Docker. Uh, it's a pretty good write up. So it sort of walks you through what Docker is, how it works, uh, why would you use it, it shows you how to build a very basic Docker file for Node.js apps specifically. So this is, this is going to talk about JavaScript apps. This is why I'm uh, talking about it in the first place, right? Shows you how to start with your uh, basic building. So build the image, push it to the um, hub, whatever you use. Uh, in this case, I believe they're pushing it to the um, Docker Hub, which will make the image public unless you pay them, right? But if you are using um, GitHub, they now actually have the container registry integrated. So if you already have a private repository, you can push the image into GitHub and just, you know, store it there. Uh, again, the same thing, they use Travis CI for um, deploying and running everything. You can use GitHub Actions, which has a tighter integration to the GitHub itself. So it's a lot easier. You don't have to like push keys or whatever to the repo and secrets and you can just, you know, push the image to your private repo, which works a lot better. At least this is what I found out in my cases. But nonetheless, the tutorial itself is, is quite straightforward. So you would, you know, build the image, test the stuff and then deploy it to your uh, VM. In this case, the author uses a pretty simple uh, SSH script. Uh, so the shell script over SSH, that would just um, execute whatever you want on your machine and then run the Docker commands, right? Which uh, I used to do that. This way works, like you set it up once. Uh, the problem is you have to push, put your private key uh, and you know manage the SSH keys and uh, public server signatures in side of Travis or GitHub Actions or whatever. That's a bit annoying. And second of all, it's still a pain in ass to write this kind of scripts when you just need to basically, you know, do Docker build, Docker run, and Docker stop the old container, and that's basically it. Which is, there's a better way, right? So, and if you are looking for a better way, I'm just gonna do some shilling. There is Exaframe. I built that. It's pretty great. It basically does exactly the same thing, but not over SSH, but rather over HTTPS and builds the Docker images for you. You don't even have to write the Docker file. So if you are looking for a continuous deployment tool for your projects, then do check this one out. <laughs> All right. Anyway, this was uh, it for articles and news. Uh, now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Um, <laughs> convinced me, Habs is welcome to the stream. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad to hear that I'm able to convince you. <laughs> Anyway, um, tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We got four things here today, starting with a very weird bug that happened in Chromium uh, last week. So the new version of Chromium was released. Uh, it was Chrome 80. Uh, it was not just Chromium, Chrome as well, right? And Edge and all the Chromium-based browsers. And this release broke array.reduce. Um, sometimes, that's the, that's the interesting part here. Sometimes array.reduce 
would be called with the wrong accumulator. And the thing is that was this bug was not 100% reproducible. So you had to run this code multiple times to actually get the bug. I was able to reproduce it like, I don't know, two out of 10 times or something, one out of five maybe, maybe one out of four, but it's, it's very inconsistent. But there's like a whole big discussion, people going crazy because just imagine you had a code base, you update your browser and something randomly breaks. It's not a WebKit error, it's the V8 error. So this is the problem in, in V8 in uh, Chrome backend, right? So this, if Node were to update to the same version of the V8, you would have the same problems in Node.js, which is even, even more terrifying. And another reason to have unit tests set up for your project so that you know nothing breaks when you, you know, update dependencies. Uh, now, the thing is that they finally, you know, there's a whole long discussion tracking down the bug. I think they probably found a more reproducible case somewhere down there, but it was actually fixed. So the fix is now published. The Chrome version, uh, whatever is the latest one is now no longer contains that. It works perfectly fine. But the fact that this was able to happen is just mind blowing. Just imagine, you know, like you, you have a basic thing like array.reduce and I'm pretty sure there are tests for that specific case, like probably more than like a dozen or something, right? And this weird bug was still able to go through the whole like, you know, pre-production testing. I don't know what else is this staging maybe they do, they do like the, they did, they did canary, they did beta version, right? And the bug was in all of them. And no matter what kind of test they had, it still somehow sneaked in, it's just mind blowing. But yeah, if you're curious, do read through the thread. There's some uh, interesting insights. Again, it's um, on one hand, very amusing to see people go crazy about that. On the other hand, it's terrifying because I was, um, you know, in a place like this a couple of times with other software, not the browsers, but it's, it's always a very, very strange place to be. And when you're like, okay, I know that it worked yesterday, but it no longer works today. What the hell happened? And then you find out that you upgraded one of the the run times that you're using and it broke everything. So you have to roll back to the older one and figure out, you know, what, what why, why? So yeah, that, that happened. Somehow array reduce got broke. Okay, uh, continuing, we got building the web we want. Um, the announcement of the web community called the web we want uh, that is uh, done in collaboration with uh, Google, Mozilla, Samsung Internet, Igalia and uh, Edge Team. So Microsoft as well, right? The gist of this community is that uh, it's an open initiative for web developers and designers or for people who actually build the web. And it's a way to tell the browser vendors what should they focus on or what should they building, uh, be building or fixing. And essentially the gist is you can go there and suggest whatever you want, right? So there is already a ton of ones and some of them are really, really cool. Like my, one of my favorite ones that I've seen so far is this one. I want browsers to fix automatically fixable accessibility problems, right? So um, if you have like there's accessibility is a big point, especially if you're building for, uh, you know, customer market and uh, customer facing things. And a lot of the accessibility problems can be fixed automatically by the browsers, right? So there's there's a lot of little things that they can easily just make more accessible without developers even thinking. This is an amazing suggestion. And I, I remember somewhere reading that the Microsoft team is already looking into that, which is even cooler. Progressive web apps on iOS, but uh, progressive web apps on iOS already work, right? It's like, yes, they're not as good as ones on Android. And there's like a lot of missing bits here and there, but they still work okay. I mean, I'm using them uh, quite a lot of time. I'm most of my, okay, not most I'm lying, but like, I, 30% of apps I use on iOS are installed as a progressive web app and they work perfectly fine. But yes, they do miss quite a bit. It's like the, the whole, well, I mean, iOS is lagging behind in, in terms of web support like crazy. It's, it's, it's a bit sad. Uh, can't see Apple on the web we want. Yeah, Apple is not here, unfortunately. Maybe not yet. Maybe they will, you know, join at some point. It would be actually very interesting to see how the Safari will work out in the long term because, you know, Microsoft has now picked up the Chromium, so... Uh, anyway, uh, we'll see how it develops. So if you, if you, if you just, you know, want something from web, then there you go. You can just fill out your, the form here and send your suggestion and, um, they're gonna look at it. And if it's good, then they're gonna probably implement it. And yeah, as I said, you know, there's like a ton of really cool suggestions here. 
like uh, man i really want the containers that firefox has to be the browser thing um only chromium is not really good for web i totally disagree i think chromium is great for web like i know that there's downsides to having only one engine but it is not one engine now there's three engines right and uh chromium itself is an amazing boon to web like there's now two major teams working on that engine so it's no longer dominated by google so the micro but at least my thoughts is that the microsoft should be able to balance out the google in terms of the way the chrome chromium should develop by basically you know doing as much work on the web standards and everything as much google does of you know putting random apis in chrome and then being like hey we're we're gonna we're gonna just add this thing and not tell anyone and then just say hey web components we cannot remove them because they're gonna break the web because that happened uh, Igalia is, yeah, it's something I haven't heard about as well. I don't know what is that. A private company based in Spain and known for their contributions to GNOME project. Oh, okay. So they are like Linux Linux guys. That's pretty cool. Um, so they, they seem to be the contributors to open source and, you know, contributing to WebKit, Chrome, Chromium Blink, Firefox, which, yeah, sounds like a perfect fit to me. Okay, anyway, continuing, we got another cool news from the Webpack land. The specification for native image load blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> that was hard. Let me try that again. The specification for native image lazy loading has been merged into HTML standard. So we uh, this year, I guess, maybe next year, we're gonna get official finalized spec that is gonna be image loading equals lazy is gonna be properly official and you're going to be able to use that in the browser without any JavaScript and it's just gonna work. I I actually am curious. Can you, can I, so can I, can, bleh, can I use um, image lazy? This uh, image lazy loading via, yeah, okay. Uh, so it's so far edge chromium. Oh, okay, so it's not in Firefox yet, I guess, because it's not web standard. It's not in Safari either, but it's gonna come there. So, you know, I guess in half a year, maybe next year, we're gonna be able to use that without any polyfills or anything like that, which is, Bridget and awesome in my opinion. So there you go. Okay, last thing we got here for today is the uh, deprecation notice for the request.js. Uh, request.js is now, as the notice says, fully deprecated. So there will no longer be any updates, patches, bug fixes, whatever. So if you're still using it, it's time to switch. There is an issue with collection of alternatives. Uh, so, you know, if you are, that, that, I think I've covered this issue in back in 2019 as well when uh, Miguel was uh, talking about the deprecation in sort of soft mode, I guess, with bug fixes and everything. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's very old, it's very big, and there's a lot of better clients out there, including things like Axios, God.js, or whatever else, like even Fetch, like, come on. So if you're using Request, time to migrate, uh, you've been warned. All right, uh, now we're coming to the releases section. We got two of them this week. The first one is Firefox version 73. Um, we finally got the bloody default zoom in Firefox. So this is the feature that been bugging me. This is literally the only thing that uh, prevented me from switching to Firefox for some time until I found that you can actually tweak that through the hidden config, which was annoying, but you know, I still wanted to try Firefox. But now you can finally do the same thing in Chrome as you could in Chrome, right? You can go to the options, you can set the default zoom level and it will actually work for all the websites. Hey, if you're blind like me, that's great news for you. And uh, yeah, it also has, so basically it's accessibility release. It adds the high contrast mode support for the um, Windows, um, Windows high contrast mode that it has integrated. I believe it was not the case as well. So, you know, if you are blind or like me, or you have a poor eyesight or you use the high contrast mode and this releases for you, maybe maybe this will make you rethink the Firefox and switch to it, try to switch to it one more time. Personally, I, I mean, I liked it. There's a couple of things that annoyed me to no extent because of my workflows, but it's a really, really good browser. So there we go. Okay, and the next release we got here is Ionic version five with uh, iOS 13 design updates, brand new API for creating your own custom animations, revamped ion icons, updated ionic colors, new starter designs, and a bunch of other things. It actually looks pretty damn fancy, to be honest. 
So like if you are, you know, using Ionic or maybe if you're considering using it, then do check this one out. It actually looks really, really good. And uh, yeah, it seems like they're progressing quite nicely. So building a very straightforward hybrid apps for mobile uh, got quite a lot nicer. Or a 4K monitor. Oh yeah, definitely. If you have a very high resolution monitor, Firefox was, <laughs> was really painful to use. <laughs> Like it kind of did scale. So like the Windows has this whole scaling thing, right? When you open the, uh, if you open the settings for the screen, you can set out the default scaling for the apps. Somehow Firefox was always scaling lower than the Chrome did. So for me, you know, I have the 1440p screen. Chrome looks fine. Firefox looked super tiny and my eyes was hurting from looking at the extensions. <laughs> this was like one of the problems, but yeah, um, anyway. Uh, yes, uh, this is it for releases, just two of them. Now we're coming to the libraries, demos, uh, and all the other interesting stuff. We do have quite a few here today with some pretty cool things. Starting with the use places autocomplete, which is a pretty nice React hook for the Google Maps places autocomplete uh, API that allows you to, well, autocomplete places for your um, website, you know. So if you're working with the geolocations, this might be a very nice hook to use. It's also accessible and everything. So this is uh, probably, um, you know, a nice tool to use. Anyway, continuing, we got Alpine, a rugged minimal framework for composing JavaScript behavior in your markup. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm not a fan of, of models like this, but you know, maybe you are. So it's, it's, a, it's an essentially extension to the, um, to the markup. Yeah, it's, I always find those weird. Like I, again, you know, um, this is from the coming from the guy who hated JSX at first when I started learning React. I was like, why would I want that? And then after a few tries, it finally clicked with me and uh, I started kind of loving it. But uh, yeah, this one, it looks interesting. So basically the author compares it to Tailwind for JavaScript. Um, and there's definitely some interesting ideas, but I don't know. I would probably need to try and use it in a proper project to figure out if that's something that I want. But anyway, check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. Right, continuing, we got multi-menu. Um, a library to create multi-level navigation menus with smooth transitions like native apps. So essentially just, you know, the side menus that are nested and you can go uh, up and down levels with nice animations, different categories and so on and so forth. Looks pretty nice. Uh, so if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It doesn't, as far as I understood, it doesn't actually require anything like jQuery. So it's a pretty slim and standalone, uh, just CSS and JS. Yes, and then you just instantiate the menu on a specific uh, uh, selector and off you go. Okay, next thing we got here is uh, Sherect. Uh, I absolutely love the reference to Shrek here. Uh, it's a share selection text. Uh, so it's a, essentially it's a tiny JavaScript that allows you to select the text and then it will show you the share bot so social share buttons like Twitter, Facebook or whatever. I believe those are configurable. So. If you wanted to add something like this, uh, it says yes, like medium. So medium, you've probably seen this feature. Um, you can check it out. Seems to be very simple, very straightforward. And again, 2.9 kilobytes gzipped, which is quite nice. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Lay. Uh, still work in progress, but it is a very cool looking tool uh, from the Luke Edwards. I already had him on this podcast quite a few times. This is a driver agnostic database migrations tool. So it's essentially allows you to migrate your databases in a very, very simple way, which definitely has potentials because database, blah, 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 let me try that again. Database migrations are, you know, probably one of the most annoying things to do if they are not automated. And this seems like a very nice attempt of making them easy. So if you're working with databases, do check it out. Uh, for now, it supports Postgres, PG, MySQL, MySQL 2, and better SQLite 3. There's more driver support coming and it's not yet complete. So it's still work in progress. Um, you know, make sure to keep that in mind, but it does look really cool. So uh, there we go. Right, so next thing we got here is Heimdall, uh, the self-hosted personal email guard. Email what? No, that's not a word. Self-hosted personal email guardian with one-step deployment. 
So if you wanted to self-host your email and if you wanted to have a proper spam protection, then this tool actually looks like a really, really cool one. So do check this one out. It seems to be uh, that it's been in development for quite a few years now and it's um, pretty mature. So I've, uh, I think I've picked it up on Hacker News and the author was saying that he's using it basically daily. So you can be sure that it's pretty well maintained. Uh, so there you go. If you are doing self-hosting uh, of email, then definitely check this one out. Right, continuing, we got Open Chakra, visual editor for Chakra UI. All right, so this one is pretty cool. It literally allows you to drag and drop stuff and uh, assemble UIs like this, which, you know, it's it works pretty damn well. And yes, it's built only around um, Chakra UI, which is one specific UI library, but it's a really nice editor and it allows you to export your code to open sand uh, sorry to code sandbox so that you can actually edit it in react uh, as if it was just the basic code which is uh, pretty damn nice so yeah and uh, the author here claims that it's going to produce a production ready code and uh, there's live props editing and styling and all that kind of stuff so if you are curious, um, do check it out. There is more planned uh, cool things like, you know, material and React Kit support, which makes perfect sense and shouldn't be too hard to implement. Uh, but yeah, looks looks really, really neat. So if you are into the visual UI editing, do check this one out. Uh, maybe this is your cup of tea. Okay, continuing, we got Lion Web Components. Uh, this is a set of highly performant, accessible and flexible web components. The accessibility is very important bit because if you ever try to work with web components, you know that by default, all of them are non-accessible, uh, which is a huge pain in the ass. And uh, this set of web components essentially tries to solve that by making most of them accessible. So there's still some of them are work in progress. Uh, some of them are not accessible yet at all, but uh, you know, it's, it's pre version 1.0. So keep that in mind, but it looks really nice. I should dive into web components again at some point to check out if, if it's worth coming back to them from React side. <laughs> All right, continuing, we got node question answering, fast and production ready question answering with Distilbert in Node.js. Now, uh, this is a question answering uh, tool set that allows you to do question answering on texts in three lines of code, which is really, really cool. Uh, the way it works is super straightforward. It uses TensorFlow backend with the BERT model or specifically Distilbert, which is the distilled BERT, which is uh, this lightweight, faster, more memory efficient model. Uh, there's a link to the paper here if you're curious. Um, but yeah, essentially it's just, you know, wrap around TensorFlow model, which works nice, I guess. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it has a decent uh, metrics. And the cool thing is that it allows you to use it in two ways. So the simple way is just gonna run in memory or the second way you can actually use TensorFlow serving as a remote service to run this uh, in a distributed fashion on a you know faster server that does you know better support TensorFlow, for example, with maybe GPUs or something. Uh, so if you are interested, do check it out. There is also comparison with you know Python and everything, and it seems to be performing quite damn nice. So there we go. Okay, continuing, we got ASCII3D. Um, yeah, I I don't know why you would want that. I don't know why you would build that, but that exists. It's a text-based 3D rendering library for JavaScript. It allows you to render 3D models using ASCII. Uh, I, don't I don't know what else I can say about that. That's basically all I have to know. There is a bunch of demos here and um, they are just as, well, no, come on, why would you download that? They are basically just as bonkers as you would think. And so, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's like if you want to render text cubes, then you can with that library. <laughs> anyway, continuing, we got a uh, hacker UI, a design system for modern developer. Uh, yeah, so it's a design system uh, built for uh, React and it, it looks minimalistic. Uh, relatively nice. So if you are not a fan of using something like Tailwind and if you want to use a predefined design system, then do check this one out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Um, bear in mind, it is still in alpha. It is pre version 1.0. So there may be things missing, things broken, but it, you know, looks kind of nice. Okay, next thing we got here is Node.js CLI apps best practices. 
So this is the um, collection of best practices for command line interface apps, uh, specifically for Node.js. Um, it's really good. Like there is a nice collection of what you should do or not do. And if you need more details, there is an expanded description which specifically explains what is this all about. And in places where it's relevant, it also recommends you packages that you can use to do that, which is a really damn good collection. So if you're building command line apps and we're looking for something like this, do check it out. It's actually a really, really good one. All right, next thing we got here is full calendar. Uh, JavaScript calendar that is full sized and supports a bunch of different layouts, um, you know, drag and drop of events, which basically looks like Google calendar, uh, resource timelines, time grids, uh, selectable dates, background events, theming, locales, time zones, and well, everything you basically want to have, it seems. So if you are working with uh, something that requires a calendar, do check this one out. It actually looks really good. What is the, it's MIT licensed even. So there you go. It's a pretty amazing offer to be honest. I should probably start it because that sounds like a very useful thing to have. Right, next thing we've got here is debug visualizer plugin for VS Code that, uh, well, I personally wouldn't use something like that because I don't like, uh, I'm not too much of a visual person, let's put it this way. I typically tend to construct things like this in my head, but I know that there are developers who prefer to be a lot more visual, right? And uh, what this plugin does is it basically visualizes data structures during debugging, which might be extremely helpful. So if that looks interesting, do check it out. It is again, just for the VS code for now, maybe it's gonna fork into, I mean, theoretically it should also work with something like uh, Atom, right? Without too much hassle, but it does look pretty neat. So if you are a visual guy and need help with uh, debugging, do check this one out. It's actually pretty damn cool. Right, and the last thing we got here for today in libs and demos section, uh, is Atom still a thing? I think so. I mean, it didn't really go anywhere, right? I, I don't remember seeing any update notes lately. So when was the latest release? This is, yeah, okay, the latest release is actually relatively new, but somehow they stopped announcing them or something. It seems like most of the changes are just minor fixes now. Seems like they just, you know, decided that they're not gonna push it that much. But I mean, I guess, you know, I understand the reasoning because Atom is GitHub, which is now Microsoft and VS Code is also Microsoft. So like two competing things, I guess they're just gonna slowly phase Atom out and uh, just leave the VS Code, which is already superior in my opinion. Uh, I'm curious, JS itself only had spec as proposals, not like Rust Elixir. I can't find the source of JS programming language, implementation of JS language is depend JS engine. Uh, you, I mean, the spec is called ECMAScript, right? So this is what you want to be looking for. Uh, there is, um, da -da -da, there, so there's ECMA 262, which is the standard. And there's the ECMAScript 2019, which is the language spec. And this is exactly what you want. Uh, so when the proposal accepted, every engine must implement it itself. Yes, this is exactly how it works. Once the new version of uh, language spec is released, all the engines must update and must comply with the latest version. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure if that's like, you know, must, but this is basically what they do. <laughs> because otherwise they would start breaking the web and this is sort of the main rule of ECMAScript is don't break the web. So um, browsers kind of follow that. Lol in WebKit. Well, I mean, WebKit does, ha does do they have? So um, ECMAScript. 2019 is the latest one, right? Um, browser support is what we want. I remember there was this table with, yeah, there we go. Um, 2016, 19, next um, 16 plus, is that what we want? So 17, yeah, okay, there we go. Babel, we don't care, is there a way to filter those? Show unstable platforms, don't show those. Um, yeah, okay, so there's quite a bit of features that are still not implemented even in Firefox. But yeah, theoretically the way it works is spec is released and then all browsers should pick it up and implement it and uh, start working with it. 
So 2020 features should not be implemented or I guess don't have to be implemented anywhere yet. Uh, so we should be do -do -do, current browser. So Chrome obviously is the, the best one in terms of support. There is, let's see, so mobile, mobiles, whatever, they're always a suck. Um, so shared memory atomics for whatever reason are not implemented in Firefox. They're still behind the flag, which is interesting. I, I guess there's some, again, drama is on. There's like wh whenever something is not implemented in Firefox, you know that there's probably some drama going on with the standards and the Mozilla guys are against whatever the Chrome guys try to do. So I'm guessing the same thing here. Um, I wonder why the regex improvements are not in Firefox yet. Uh, some of them are not in Safari, which is interesting. Like most of them are, but like <laughs> one of them is not. Look behind is not in Safari. Why? Um, did you see us? Yeah, I think I covered this SWC in one of the previous podcasts. It was like, man, what was it? Last year or something? It was around for quite some time. Did they ever reach version one? Because I remember they were lacking quite a bit in uh, in features in comparison to Babel. But anyway, coming to the last leap we got here for today is ES Build, an extremely fast JavaScript bundler in Minifier. Uh, seems to be a lot faster than Rollup, Terzor, Webpack, and Parcel. I, yeah, it seems like it's faster because it supports subset of features, which, I mean, you know, it's not hard to be faster when you don't support majority of things that, well, those big guys do basically. So if you need something very simple that could just bundle minify your stuff without any additional features, then maybe this is the way to go. Otherwise, I, yeah, I don't think I'm, we're going to be switching anytime soon from roll up that back or parcel. All right. Uh, this is it for libs and demos. We got a uh, three interesting and silly things today. So the first one is plink plonk JS. I, <laughs> you know what? That should have been a separate repository and that should have been released on NPM. Now, uh, so that <laughs> that's a tiny script. You can copy this thing into your console and what it does, it sets up a mutation observer for the current document. And whenever the new mutations happen, it will create a new oscillator and then generate the sine wave based on the mutations length, which makes, which basically means that as soon as your page starts changing, as in, you know, the single page not refreshing, it will start making sounds, which is just absolutely bonkers. I'm not going to demonstrate that, but, <laughs> but if you want to, you can try it. And it's actually very amusing, especially on the websites like, you know, Reddit, Fiddly, Twitter, whatever, with endless scrolling. It is very, very hilarious. So I really want that as an NPM package. Um, okay, anyway, <laughs> the next thing we got here is Explain Shell, a really cool website that uh, explains how exactly the command works in your shell. So you can just write any command you want. Uh, there's a bunch of examples here and it will explain line by line what exactly is this doing with a very detailed explanation, which is really, really damn cool. D more didn't happen. Well, you, you're just forcing my hand here. You're just forcing my damn hand. Um, let me see. So I have unmuted my desktop. I am going to copy this. We're going to go to Twitter, for example. Ah, why not? I'm going to open the Vulture game. I've been monitoring their server situation, trying to play that. I'm going to throw this in here. Oh God, it's, oh God, it's already. It's already making sound. God. There you go. <laughs> uh, you know what? No, that's enough. That's enough. That, that, that. <laughs> okay. That was your fault, by the way. I did not want to do that. So, okay. Anyway, <laughs> coming back to explain shell. Uh, this thing is indeed awesome. And if you are just learning the shell or if you, you know, you find some weird command online and you have no idea how it works, you can literally just throw it in here and it will explain what is happening, including the snippets from the manual, which is just freaking amazing. So, and it even gives you the source for the man pages. So you can actually go and explore the tool itself. So if you're working with shell, if you're just getting started, or maybe you are, you know, want to improve your knowledge and you're not always sure what exactly is happening in the commands you see online, 
do have a look at that. This is just uh, invaluable. This is freaking awesome. Okay, and the last thing we got here for today is the announcement from GitHub Enterprise. Uh, GitHub Enterprise is now free through Microsoft for startups. So if you are doing a startup, you can apply for Microsoft for startups and you will get a GitHub Enterprise for free, I believe for two years or something. Uh, yeah, so thousands of dollars of monthly credits uh, over 45 seats, which is absolutely bonkers. So if you are doing startups, then, you know, GitHub just got a lot more attractive, basically. So do check this out if that sounds interesting. All right, um, that's actually it from my side. So if you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Uh, meanwhile, I will tell you that you can find all the links I've mentioned on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. We also have a Discord chat where you can come around and chat about JavaScript or video games or whatever. Uh, the VOD of this uh, will be available immediately on Twitch and after a few hours on YouTube, if you missed any of that stuff. Um, uh, in addition to what we have telegram channel where I post unfiltered links. If you're curious to see, you know, how much uh, stuff I collect over the duration of the week. And if you just want to see it immediately, instead of waiting for that, there should be an audio version of the podcast as well. If that's interesting for you on anchor FM or uh, po pocket casts or whatever the hell you want, I think it should be on um, Spotify. No, wait, not Spotify yet. iTunes, but not Spotify. Spotify is coming soonish. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Uh, let me have a look at this Rust Neon. Uh, Neon is here. What is Neon? I personally liked Rust, but I don't think I would want to build. Uh, what is Neon? Wait a second. Uh, platform blah, 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 blind, blah, blah, safe and fast native Node.js modules. Oh, okay. That's that sounds like fun. Okay, cool. But um, I mean. Rust is great, but you know, once we, I think once Deno matures, it has a lot nicer model of creating native plugins than um, Node.js. So this this does look a lot better. And yeah, I remember looking at it when it was like version 0 0.1 or something, and it looked pretty damn complex. So this is a lot easier. <laughs> this We should try that at some point. Man, this looks really good. All right. Uh, thank you for sharing that dragon. That is that is really really cool. I definitely want to try that now. Uh, let me just let me just save that somewhere. I um, uh, you know what? I'm just gonna do that. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, this is definitely something I want to try now. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, any more questions, suggestions, links you guys want to share, or things you want to ask about JavaScript or whatever? Um, if not, then I guess we can just wrap it up here for today and go have a nice uh, weekend. I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds. Uh, meanwhile, do I have anything I need to do? Not really, right? I think we're good. Uh, oh, oh God, I still have the old time here. Oh my God, okay, I should. Yeah, you know what? While you're thinking, if you have any questions, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna fix the time here. Cause that's, I should probably have revalidate all my websites and Twitch schedules and, and everything uh, because I've been neglecting that for far too long. <laughs> but okay, it doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching the VOD of this. And I see you next time. Bye.